God, we give thanks to you for your, your love, your care for us. Um, we, we give thanks that you don't leave us alone in this life, that you have sought us out and you have um, sought to bring us to a higher path through, through Jesus. And we pray that as we uh, study in the book of Romans, that, that you would give us a, a new lease on life uh, to understand your, your way uh, free from sin and, and the, the results of sin so that we can know the true glory that you would have for us. Uh, we ask that you give us wisdom as we open up the scriptures this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we uh, had finished chapter 6, and we're, uh, so we'll begin in chapter 7. Um, I, you know, I, I think we want to affirm that uh, all scripture is is good for, for teaching and instruction. Um, but there are some parts that we're maybe more drawn to than others. And, uh, and, and as we begin in, in chapter 7, um, I, I think we kind of finish off a part that where he's, he's really wrestling with this issue of how we talk about or deal with sin in our uh, spiritual journey. Both, uh, and, and, and so the way that he'll, he talks about it is the, the role of, of, of sin and, and the law and how law helps us understand our, our awareness of sin, but then also how it continues to play a role or struggle in our lives. And, and then as we, as we close chapter 7, we're going to really get a sense of, of Paul's uh, description of how human beings wrestle with sin, uh, even as we seek to be uh, on a higher path through Christ. And, uh, and then, then beginning there, we move into, I think, maybe some of the payoff scriptures of, uh, of, of Romans into chapter 8 and, and, and some of the places that uh, become some of our favorite scriptures. Not that they're better than or any or less than, but there's some that we find ourselves more drawn to. So um, we'll, we'll look at knocking out chapter 7 today and, and maybe finding some of those places that we've been more uh, closely drawn to as we move into chapter 8. Uh, so in, in verse 1 of, of chapter 7, well, I should say the first two paragraphs in chapter 7, he uses the, an analogy for us about um, the way in which uh, when a person is married, they have an obligation to them that if a person passes away, they're freed from that. And so that analogy becomes one of uh, how he understands uh, the work of sin and law to be at, at work in, in our human lives. So uh, we'll start with verse 1. It says, uh, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law. So he's those who have a, an awareness of, of the, the function of the law. That the law is binding on a person only during that person's lifetime. So we die, we're free from the law. We don't have to, and you know, I guess in heaven there aren't laws, maybe. Everybody just does the right thing, so there's not a need for a law. But it governs our lives today. Um, Thus, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning her husband. That makes sense, you know, if we, 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 uh, are obligated in our relationships with each other. The law uh, as a part of uh, governing relationships between men and women and uh, a marriage, a married life uh, is a part of that. So while we're living and in that kind of relationship, it, uh, there's, there's, there's a sense of, of obligation to one another. And I think that's, that's pretty simple, pretty clear. But if one of the partners is to die, then um, that obligation a person is, is free from. Uh, and so uh, he gives us this analogy that any of us should, should be able to understand. Um, so then in verse, verse 3, Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. Again, we're obligated, we're bound to faithfulness with one another. Uh, but if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. So, uh, you know, death ends that, that obligation. Um, 
verse 4, he, he, so all this is not really to talk about marriage, though. All that is to serve as an analogy. And so in verse 4, uh, in the same way, my friends, you have died to the law through the body of Christ. So Christ sets up a new reign in our lives. And, um, and, and we're not then to govern our lives through law as, the, as, a, as a spiritual practice. It doesn't mean we're you know, free from doing what's right. But you know, we talked about how during the period after the, the destruction of the temple and the synagogues rose up, then there needed to be a new place to center uh, the spiritual life. And so the practice of the law became that center. And so they, they would focus on how do we then live a right life. And, and then the talk was really about how the law would then be written on our hearts. And, um, and the heart's the place of our emotion. It's the place of we connect with our spiritual practice. So um, whenever, whenever we have that law written on our hearts, it becomes a passion for us. It becomes something we live out. And, and, and so the, the law was a part of, of, of making sure that we kept our faith, uh, the Jewish practice that kept faith at the center of our lives and that we, we practiced those laws. So now it's saying that um, that, that sense of law, uh, that you have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another to him who has been raised from the dead in order that you may bear fruit for God. So now we have a new relationship with God through Jesus, through the one who has uh, been raised from the dead, who gave his life on our behalf and then was, was raised. So now through Jesus, through Christ, we have a new relationship with God. And it doesn't have to be governed by hundreds of laws about how we are uh, to live. But it's, it's governed by, um, by the this, this spiritual relationship we have with God through Jesus. And um, with those who you love, rarely do you have to think about, well, what's the right thing to do in how you live with them? You just do the right thing, hopefully. I mean, that's our, our intent in it. Um, we, we hopefully live that out. And so that's the, the kind of relationship that we are to have now with God, where it, it is one of, of relationship and practice that we, we just have this caring relationship with God. And so we want to be in a right relationship with him. And, and, and it's, it's not a burden. It's not um, something that law can feel like, oh, well, gosh, I've got to do all these things. Um, we, we, we hopefully do that out of a, a different kind of motivation. Um, I, you know, it, 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 it becomes a, a love, if you will, a practice of love. And, uh, and, and it's through Christ that we experience this. And it allows us then, as it says, that we may bear fruit for God, that our lives have a, a fruitfulness uh, in, in the spiritual practice, free from the burden um, that the law can often feel like. While we... In uh, verse 5, while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members so uh, to, bear, to bear fruit for death. So again, the uh, sin leaves as the, the byproduct the, the fruit of death. When we live by sin, then uh, it leads to the, the end of death. Um, and brokenness. I mean, it's uh, um, if we think of the, the very simple definition that we were often taught about sin, that sin is alienation. It's alienation from God. It's alienation from each other and from our true selves. And that's, that's what death then is, is, is being separated from all those things. And so reconciliation is overcoming that alienation, that in Jesus we're reconciled to God. And so that which would separate us, the sense of sin, is, is overcome so that we can be in a close relationship and not one of, of fear. Um, but, but the law, while it's intended to keep us on the right path, uh, because it reminds us 
where we break that, uh, that direction, uh, when we trespass it, when we step over, we feel guilt, we feel, again, the results of that, the separation that uh, comes about. So, so law is, is the awareness of that, and, it, and it, it, it's not a place that we feel positive. It's a, it's a, it's a negative motivation. And sometimes we need those. Sometimes um, when we're teenage kids, fear of mom and dad's uh, wrath can keep us on the right path. But at the same time, um, it, it brings about the awareness of what we might choose to do otherwise. And, and hopefully, as we mature, we mature out of the need for um, those kind of punitive motivations to, to ones that are more desirous. Um, the, the fear of punishment can often keep us in right behavior, but it doesn't inspire great love. Um, that we can be inspired by great love uh, through grace, and that's the, uh, the relationship we have in, with Jesus. So uh, he, he's simply kind of describing those, those parts of, of the, the relationship. In verse 6, by now we are discharged from the law, or but now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we are slaves not unto uh, old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. So law as that disciplinarian, um, is no longer necessary. And we were in now in a mature relationship with God, not of one of fear, but one of, our, of desire. And we are now committed to a relationship with God that's uh, one of new life by the Spirit rather than, as it says, the old written code. Um, kind of language about the law that, again, lets us see it as as the the custodian or the disciplinarian that would keep us on, on the path. And now we can move into maturity in relationship. So another analogy for how we deal with sin or how we understand sin uh, in our lives. There's a lot of that in this part of, of Romans. And um, it, it serves this kind of dual function. And um, and when, when he talks about law, we always need to remember it's about the whole of the Jewish code and in terms of determining right behavior. And, and it doesn't mean kind of civil law. I mean, civil and religious law, we're all one and the same in that regard. And for us, we have laws that are civil laws, and then we have spiritual practices. But they would have all been a part of one and the same thing. Uh, in their day, but for us, those are, are separated out. And so we don't think of laws that we live by in our society um, in, in a religious fashion. Um, that we, we see them as simply the civic code that we operate with, and then we see our spiritual life as, as something distinct and, and different. And, um, but that was different for Paul. And so when he says that the law is no longer necessary in this way, that we are dead to the law, again, he doesn't mean that we don't have to do right civic behavior, but it means that the law doesn't control our relationship with God any longer. So in, in verse 7, What then should we say? That the law is sin? By no means. So we're back to that same little teaching um, Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. Again, you know, the disciplinarian role of the law or the custodian that says, that allows us to realize when we've crossed it. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Now, that's an interesting kind of thing to imagine. You know, if we'd ever had the law, would, would, does that mean we wouldn't, we wouldn't covet? Um, if I didn't see somebody's brand new car and think, oh, I really like that, I wish I had one, 
Would I have not thought that if I had never heard thou shalt not covet? I, I, it's hard to, I mean, you could realize it's wrong now to, to do that, but I can't imagine that we would really be that free. I'm not, I don't want to pick an argument with Paul. That would be the wrong side to be on. But it is hard for me to imagine uh, that that's what he means. But I think it, it, what he means is then probably to draw attention to that when we see it says thou shalt not covet, then it, it really is telling us that, um, that we're in dangerous territory. That, that probably, it's a warning. It, again, it's a custodian. So when, when we see that, it, it allows us, it, it's to give us an alert that we're moving in behavior that is not good for ourselves. Um, and, and that's where um, maybe only one of us today but, you know, where practices of social media um, can really, I think, can be a dangerous thing. Uh, where people, I, I do have a few people who always put all their drama out on Facebook. But for the most part, people I know, they put their pictures of their vacation. They put, uh, you know, idealized photos of their family all together, you know. And, and, and if we think that those best images are what everybody else is living. And, 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 you know, we look at ourselves on just kind of the day-to-day -day getting through, we're gonna always feel like we're less than. And, and it'll be like, gosh, I wish I could take that vacation, you know, or I wish I could have done that or gone to the OU ball game last night or whatever it might be. And, and we can put ourselves in a place where we're seeing ourselves as less than because we're always comparing. And, and that's covetousness. And when we feel that, it should tell us we're in a place that's in a dangerous place because we're not seeing ourselves as God sees us. And we're not in that right relationship with God. We're separated from all that. And, um, and, and so it, it's not about punishing us. It's about helping us stay in the right relationship. And I, I, think, I think too often... We think of, of sin and guilt and the law as punishment. And it's really not about punishment. It's about helping us to stay where we should be and where I think ideally we're, we're best to be. But it, it, it does mean there's some things that we want to stay away from. And if we feel a desire to be in those places, then it, it may feel like punishment to give those up. Um, So in, in verse 8, but sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. So again, you know, that's that, that sense that, that, that when we know the law is there, there's the commandment, don't do it, that it's like sin takes every opportunity to, to make us more desirous. Oh, if I had just had that other... Um, I mean, why was I sent to Chickasha? I should have been sent to Edmund or, you know, as a pastor or whatever, you know, person might think in their life. Um, and that's, by the way, that's not my feeling, but that, I'm not just trying to lay out analogies that someone might understand. Um, but it takes opportunity then uh, in the commandment, producing in me all kinds of covetousness. And I like to think of that, that analogy, just where it, you know, just pops up everywhere and you can't hardly control it. I, I think the first time I was maybe aware that I always call it the Volkswagen phenomenon. So when I bought my first Volkswagen bug and after I bought it, then I saw them everywhere. But I don't remember seeing them everywhere before. You've had that experience, haven't you? You get a new car and all of a sudden you see it everywhere or you... You know, something, you do something different and all of a sudden you, it becomes to, it just shows up all the time. Well, sin kind of works that way too. Um, you know, when we become aware of something, it just starts popping up there all the time. And um, apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived. And I died, and the very commandment that promised life provided or proved to be death to me. Now, I think he may maybe drawing this out as far as he possibly can, 
but the, the really the point is that we don't look to the law to provide us the right relationship. That's what he's wanting to say. And to people who have committed themselves to the practice of the law for their whole life, he's really trying to help those Jewish Christians understand that, that, that the law is not the end-all, be-all. The, the, the end-all, be-all is our relationship with Jesus. And so the law is going to disappoint us and it's going to fall short. That, I think that really is, when you get down to it, that's, that's, that's really the, the, the primary thing. I, well, just, just because it's, it's fresh on my mind, um, we went down to pick up Anna. She was at this conference down in Austin, Texas. And we have some friends that live there in Austin. And uh, he's Jewish. And so we, we stayed the night with them on Friday night. And Saturday morning, he's up and fixing breakfast and, you know, just a pound of bacon. You know, he's frying up. And I didn't, I didn't think or say anything about it, you know. But, uh, and, you know, by, by about the time we left that morning, though, to go pick up Anna, uh, he said, well, you didn't say anything about, you know, this good Jewish boy eating pork on the Sabbath. And, and, and I said, I, I'm, I'm really not interested in guilting anybody, particularly about eating bacon. I mean, I think that's a, bacon's one of the best foods I know of. So um, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be the one who is making you feel bad about that. But, um, but you know, there was a sense that, I mean, because he, you know, he knows I'm a pastor. So he thought, okay, he'll probably say something to me about this, you know. So he was feeling the guilt of the law, you know, in his life in that moment. Um, so. You know, I, I had trouble understanding what he said, but, you know, he was alive. Uh, the, and someone I read uh, kind of cleared that up. He said that was probably was a re- reference to him before the bar Lisa. <laughs> When age 13, I believe is correct, mm-hmm. he becomes a full adult and fully responsible. Right. And suddenly he was responsible and the law jumped on him. It's negative. Yeah. Well, every every Jewish person I know uh, knows that has a Jewish mother who, who knew how to, to teach guilt. Yeah. And, um, and and so I would suspect that, that, that he probably knew from a very early day in his life where the the, the limits were, but I, but I think what he's trying to describe for us is if we could live before we have knowledge of the law, we would not know where we were breaking the law. And, and, and in that sense, that sounds like a pretty freeing place, uh, f- particularly for generations of us who've grown up with maybe too healthy a sense of guilt. Um, I, I don't want to say, you know, then we should just throw it all off and everybody gets to free, feel great about everything. But because I do think there's a place where we can feel guilt. But, but, but I know a lot of people who carry an unhealthy sense of guilt in their life. And, um, and if, if you could imagine not fe- feeling that weight, um, it would feel like being alive, I think prior to, but then, but through the law, we have this sense of guilt of where we break the law, and we all know how much we mess up, so we're going to always feel such heavy guilt, and, and the results of sin in our lives. Maybe I'm reading too much of my own life in that, but, but I, I think that's what he's trying to describe for us. It, it might be that he was very innocent, young Jewish boy, uh, who didn't understand the the nature of, of sin and around us until he took on that role into adulthood. That might be. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm just, again, psych- psychologizing it too much. But uh, I think that's, the, that, that's how I choose to read it. But I, I, I don't, I wouldn't mind anybody else reading it differently. Um, Okay, in verse 11, for sin seized an opportunity in the commandments and deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. So, you know, again, it's the, the awareness that brings death that allows us to, to I aim mean, where we, we experience sin and death and separation, alienation, uh, and the it's not that the law is bad, the law is holy, the, the law is good, but 
um, when we come to awareness of sin in our lives, then we understand the, the nature of that death and brokenness we experience. In uh, verse 13, did what is good then bring death to me? By no means. So it's not the law that brings death because the law is good, the law is holy. Um, it was sin working death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So again, the law brings awareness of sin. Um, and, and you know, I was thinking back, you know, when, um, when he talks to us about Abraham, or not, um, about Adam, the first Adam through which sin came in. And, and, and the way that we talk about that period prior to, to human sinfulness in the Garden of Eden, that that, that was that innocence period. And, um, and in, then in the fall through Adam is where we then uh, become aware of sin and then later through the... Uh, through the law, become uh, even more deeply aware of it. So in, in some of the maybe most familiar scriptures uh, to us, he, he moves into this next, next part. And we see really his humanness, I mean, the, the struggle of Paul in these next verses. Uh, verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions. That's the part of it um, where, where he really begins to kind of painfully agonize with us about in his own life. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Um, I think we all have felt caught in those in, in that practice, you know, we, we really try to change. We do everything we can to do what's right. And, and there's just something that pulls us in a way that before we realize that we've already done it. And, um, you know, it, could, it, can be, it could be a sinful practice. It could be in how we relate to a person um, that, you know, they, they've said to us, you know, Dad, just don't talk to me in that way. If we could approach it in a different way, or you know, and then we find ourselves right back there before we even tr realize it. We didn't intend to get back to that spot, but but our very nature led us back to that place. And we were like, "Gosh, if I could just walk that back a little bit, and I could figure out a new way to 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 approach the conversation with the person." Um, there's a part of us that we do some we do things so much out of our experience that we, we get there and we do the very thing we hate. Um, we say the words that we wish we hadn't said. Um, we act in a way that uh, is damaging or hurtful. Um, and, and Paul, uh, in, the, in a revelatory moment, is sharing with his audience that this is a struggle he experiences all the time. Uh, he doesn't disclose to us what those are, maybe so we can each imagine our own struggle uh, that we, we bear ourselves. Um, and, and then he, he you know, continues this conversation uh, it's in verse 16. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree... Um, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells with, uh, within me. It, the, the, I, the language gets confusing for us, but um, he's, he's talking about the part, you know, where we, we want to do one thing, we find ourselves doing the other, and we want to stay away from doing this thing, and yet, in trying to stay away from it, we find ourselves right back there. Um, but in fact, uh, okay, I already read that. But in fact, uh, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So sin functions as a, as a part of our life, and it motivates us in ways that um, are not about our conscious decision-making, but either from habit or practice or um, 
or just the leading of, of desire and sin, we find ourselves outside of what we really would like to do and to be. Um, in a way, I kind of imagine the, the person who's trying to uh, wrestle with alcoholism um, and, and the, the desire to take a drink um, is so strong. And the practice that they've had in their lives that leads to that is so much a part of it that um, it seems like a power unto itself. And it is. I mean, it, it, it basically is. And, um, and, and even though they would will to do something different, they find themselves back in that same place. Um, it's, you know, it's a, again, a part of the, the brokenness of our, our relationship in terms of our true self and, and who we are with God. I think that's why in the 12 step method, it, there's a part where it says, you know, that I can't do this. It's only through God calling on a higher power that, that this can be done. And, um, in a sense, then turning over the idea that we can control this and we allow ourselves to, to, to be in a better place in a relationship with God. Um, for I know that, in verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. You know, we can say in our minds, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, or I'm going to do what's right, I'm going to do what's right, and then something else is at play. Um, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Nor if I do what I do not want, it is no longer, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. And this isn't blaming, this isn't, you know, blaming the devil. That, you know, oh, the devil made me do it. Um, I, I think I probably told you, I mean, that was never an answer that was going to work in my family. I mean, you, you could not avoid responsibility by saying the devil made me do it. Uh, you know, you're a child of God. You have more power than that. You know, <laughs> you, you can't fall back on that, that answer. Um, and he's not trying to do that, but he's trying to acknowledge the very real fact that there's that sin is is real, and it's powerful, and it is dark and manipulative, and it's it's the parts of us that we really least like about ourselves, and and it's hard to to be away from to get away from, and and yet it still is within us, and it's we talked about those two two images of being good and created in God's image, but also being sinful and fallen. And, um, and it's not a duality of good and evil battling with us. That's what Star Wars is, you know. That's what, that's what you know, movies and things are, is a duality. Good and evil equal powers. Good and e- evil in equal measure. All at war with each other. That's a duality, and we don't live in a duality. Um, God is the creator of all. And so even darkness, scriptures say, is, is like light to him. Um, that, that God encompasses all of this. And so God's far bigger. And, um, and then the, so we experience ourselves caught in between, but God is not going to allow that to be the final end. And the final end is that, um, is that he gives us Christ who is at work in our lives to reconcile us back to God in a way that awareness of the law um, is not going to be able to do. If there's that duality of good and evil, the law is kind of that border that separates uh, where the two are. Um, and, and I think I told you there's a, there's a whole part of uh, oral teaching about the law that's called the Mishnah that was at work during Jesus' day. And so you had the law and then you had the Mishnah, which is the teachings about the law. And so it kind of set up another boundary outside there. So if you, if you didn't violate the Mishnah, the teachings about the law, then you weren't even getting close to violating the law. So it was like another boundary to keep you separated from, from that which was evil. And, um, 
And in a way, what Paul's advocating is uh, it's almost, it feels maybe almost dangerous to those who, who have felt the practice of the law as being that protector. It says, tear down the wall uh, because the wall is not helping us any longer. Um, the, that wall that we think protects us away from sin now has become a barrier itself in, in, in experiencing grace. And that in Jesus, we now have a relationship with God where we don't need all of that. We don't need all of that protection. We're in a right relationship with God. And when we are, our heart's right and we are to live right. Now, the, that's the part of the, and you know, again, he's, that's where then he say, okay, does that mean we get the law is bad and we need to throw it out? Well, no, it's not that. But, but it's not that grand protector that we've always thought it was. Um, Christ is that for us. So then we get to, to verse 21. So I find that it is, I would say, a principle. I think that's what he means here. Uh, but he's, you know, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. By law, he doesn't mean like the old Jewish practice of the laws. But he says this is a principle that's true. Or we might talk about, you know, like laws of nature, law of gravity, things like that, that this is a principle that's always going to hold true. And this principle is that what I want to do, uh, when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. I, I want to do what's right by God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind. So my mind wants to do what's right. The desires, the passions of the body want to do what's wrong. Making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. He feels caught. Uh, he, you know, he's, he's in this place of being pulled by both. Um, you know, the, the little angel on one shoulder telling him to do what's good. The devil on the other shoulder telling him to do what's bad. Wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me? from this body of death. I mean, I'm, I'm caught. I'm, I, I need help. I can't do this myself any longer. No matter how much I will to do the law and stay in a right relationship with God, it's, it's not enough. I can't simply do it. I need help. Who's going to rescue me? Who's going to help me? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus is our help. And whenever we have him to be with us, um, it's about a term that we don't talk about much, surrender. When we surrender the struggle, like we have to win it, and we allow Jesus to be in that place, then we can move past it. We can be free from it, because now it's, it's Jesus who dwells in us. And, and, but we have to surrender ourselves, our trying to fight the battle, um, in order to allow him to have that control in our lives. And, and when we do, then it's Christ who rescues us. So then, with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. So he... You know, he says that we're going to always have this battle. We're going to always have this tension. But the thing that can, can win it for us is Jesus, is, is trusting in his grace. And when we do, and we can live that out, then we're in that right relationship. The problem is we forget. You know, we, we wake up every day to a new day. And... Um, the one day at a time struggle. Uh, the victory of yesterday is yesterday's victory. So today becomes the new day of struggle. And so I have to invite Jesus into my life again today to help me to win that battle. And pretty soon after we've done that and we've done that and we've done that, we're walking with him enough that we don't find ourselves caught in that same place. But <clears throat> one of the things that... 
um, that psychology modernly teaches us about ourselves is that when we get into places of stress or difficulty, we fall back onto old patterns. And, and so the patterns that we've had in our lives that um, have gotten us through to where we are, sometimes those are the, they can be the evil patterns, the patterns where sin has, has had uh, sway in our lives that when we get into to places of difficulty, they, they can creep their way back in. And, uh, and so it, it, it's never over for us. Paul's worked at this all his life, and, and he still feels caught. But he knows where the answer is, and he's telling us where the answer is. And, um, and that each day we get the opportunity to start again at it. And, um, and in this, this wrestle we, we have between the good which we seek to do and the bad which we find ourselves often doing. Now, as I look out here and I see Jeannie, you know, I think, what in the world could she do wrong? I mean, you know, I can't, I mean, how am I going to try to describe sin the way that, that Jeannie Bledsoe can understand that? I don't know, you know. Um, but I, I think that's the, the real wrestle, the real tension that he, he's wanting to get it to get at with us and, and that the law may give us some guidance. The law gives us awareness of where we're messing up, but it's never going to put us in the right relationship with God. Um, it's going to always make us feel bad for when we've messed up, and it's always going to, through that, in a way, be a reminder of where sin is, is continually present in our lives. Um, one of the things, though, that we know is the longer people are on this journey, the more realization they have of how much they need to grow and um, one of I, I don't know we maybe attribute everything to Mother Teresa these days whether right or not but I, one of the things that that I've, I've heard her say I know it was true Billy Graham had said was that the the the, the more he grows in his life the more he realized that uh, how much he he still had yet to do and um, and so Maybe that's the, the continuing motivation for each of us and that we can rely and trust more on God's grace. And if we messed up yesterday, well, that's too bad for yesterday. Today's a new day. Let's give it another good shot. Um, and hard, part of that alienation we have is that there are people we've let down and when we know, okay, yesterday was that day, today is a new day, and I'm going to try, they may not be willing to have forgotten what happened yesterday yet. So, I mean, not everybody's going to be on that same page with us um, if, if we're, we're on that practice. Um, but, but we might be surprised. We might be surprised at people who are willing to give us more grace than we give ourselves to and, uh, and hope for the best for us even when we can't quite see it yet. So um, God will be at work in all those places, I think, hopefully.